Uh, good morning again, uh, everybody. Well, um, I tried to show you yesterday how the great renewal of the church that took shape in the early years of the 12th century had resulted in a quite unprecedented need for large numbers of new church buildings uh, across lowland Scotland, and how that had led to uh, the development of very close architectural relationships with England. Uh, initially, of course, Scotland had to be largely dependent on imported master masons for the design of the new buildings, though by the later 12th century, Scottish masons do appear to have been playing an increasingly creative role uh, in which the architectural opportunities within Scotland meant that they were perhaps as much contributors to the pool of ideas uh, as their northern English neighbours were. But the relationship with England was, of course, to change at the end of the 13th century with the outbreak of warfare between the two countries following the deposition of John Balliol by Edward I. And for the first two-thirds of the 14th century, uh, the scope for large-scale ecclesiastical building projects uh, was very greatly reduced. I did point out that some building was still taking place in the more settled phases of the reigns of Robert I and David II, uh, and I mentioned St Andrews, Perth and Dunfermline, and later St Monans, uh, and also um, outlying parts of the kingdom, including Fern and Orense. Uh, but it does have to be admitted that it's very difficult to perceive any real sense of direction uh, in those few buildings that have come down to us. Um, well, when the momentum of large-scale building eventually uh, began to gather pace in the later decades of the 14th century, it almost seems as if patrons were having to start all over again in deciding what their building should look like. And in the following lectures, I'd like to try to explore with you some of the options that they do seem to have investigated. It seems to me that three broad alternatives to seeking guidance through England took on particular significance. Uh, these were, in, in no particular order, uh, a limited renewed use of forms that had been favoured in earlier buildings in Scotland, the adoption and adaptation of forms that were in current use in secular architecture, involving especially the use of barrel vaulting, uh, and seeking fresh inspiration from neighbouring countries in continental Europe, with northern France and the Low Countries evidently being especially attractive in this respect. Nevertheless, uh, despite the breach with England that resulted from the wearisomely long years of intermittent warfare, in at least a small number of cases, it was English architectural guidance that was once again being sought. Indeed, on the evidence that we see in those cases, it might almost have seemed as if Scotland was about to resume its close architectural relationship with its southern neighbour, and it's those buildings that I'd like to look at with you uh, in today's first lecture. Uh, just to confuse our president, I've slightly modified my title uh, to Renewing Architectural Links with England. I'm not quite sure why I've renewed it, but it seemed a good idea at the time. Um, so let's start looking. And as I said yesterday, we're going to be starting by having a look at Melrose Abbey, which really is in many ways uh, a barometer of changing architectural tastes for the rest of the Middle Ages in Scotland. Uh, it was rebuilt after an, an attack by the forces of Richard II of England in 1385, uh, and it was started on a very grand scale with uh, finishes of the very, very highest quality. Uh, in fact, I think it was started on a scale that the Abbey quite simply couldn't afford. Uh, and building was a very protracted operation, and I think it was probably never, in fact, finished. In fact, I'm not at all sure that very much more was built than what we see here. Uh, obviously, there would have been roofs over the parts that were built, uh, but I'm not sure that it would have gone very much further uh, west than the monastic choir in the east bays of the structural nave here, and these uh, chapels which were out and along the, uh, the south side of the nave. Uh, and the main reason for thinking that is that we do still have the um, remains of the west wall of the earlier church still surviving within the area of the expanded church. And I do find it very difficult to see how that could have survived if the church of which it was a part uh, hadn't uh, at least partly survived and probably remained in use for parochial worship for the rest of the Middle Ages. But it's the first phase of building that I want to look at uh, this morning, 
Um, and I think that first phase probably uh, embraced the presbytery, uh, the rectangular presbytery just here, which is this part just here, uh, the shells of the transepts and the transeptal chapels, and probably also the arcade level of the monastic choir in the east bays of the nave. And those were built very much in uh, an English idiom. In fact, they were so very English that um, I think it is very likely that uh, rather as happened in the early 12th century, uh, English masons were brought up to carry out the work. And we do know that, in fact, Richard II um, allowed some remittance on um, revenues, uh, customs revenues, <laughs> Uh, in the early stages of the building, uh, and it may have been that this was a sort of almost a form of imperial uh, colonialism that he was uh, involved in. But this is the east end uh, of the presbytery just here. Um, I do wish that there was some sort of rule against people wearing tracksuit bottoms in photographs. Uh, it does rather lower the tone of the thing. Uh, and this is the, this is the inside of the uh, presbytery uh, that you see just there. Um, well, there is, uh, again, the inside of the presbytery, and you'll see that it's uh, a two-storied elevation it was fairly normal by this stage. I mentioned yesterday in talking about Glasgow that the idea of having a middle story uh, was really uh, seen as rather passe by uh, this stage. Uh, various devices were uh, adopted for minimizing the impact of the blank area of wall that corresponded with the roof over the aisles. Uh, here at Melrose, what they did was to extend the inner skin of the wall down below the windows and have this tracery balustrade on the inner skin just there. And that, I think, is probably looking to uh, an approach to design that had uh, emerged in uh, eastern Yorkshire uh, from around the 1320s. You see it at places like Howden, uh, but uh, illustrated very nicely um, at Selby Abbey, which was started around about the uh, 1320s, where again, here in this elevation, you can see that you're much more conscious of this blank wall where the roof over the aisles was. But of course, with the foreshortening effect of looking from below, you tend not to see it. You see the balustrade uh, running in front of it. But um, I hope you'll agree that that is quite a similar approach there. Other similar details, of course, uh, include the use of the uh, clustered sharp piers. I'll be talking more about that in the uh, next lecture. You'll be delighted to hear. Um, but also this use of uh, decorative tabernacles for images. Here at Selby, they're in the spandrels between the arches. Um, at Melrose, they're actually on the piers themselves. There's the, the capital, there's the canopy of the um, image uh, niche, and that's where the base of it was. It's been cut away. And again, that's something that you find in a number of uh, East Yorkshire buildings. Uh, this is the Lady Chapel of the much larger uh, church at uh, York Minster, where the Lady Chapel, the eastern bays of the eastern limb, were rebuilt between 1361 and 1373. Uh, and here you can see the uh, image tabernacles uh, attached to the leading shaft of the pier in pretty much the same sort of way that uh, you've got on the piers there. So these are indicators that the mason who designed this is as likely as not to have come from uh, eastern Yorkshire. And that's a view that, uh, well, the view that the mason came from northern England uh, is confirmed by a number of other details. In um, a, a sort of subset of the first phase, in the, uh, in the transept arcades, you have these absolutely delightful uh, capitals where you have tightly woven uh, foliage uh, in a, a, a convex curve, tightly clinging, clinging to the bell of the capital. And in some ways, that's rather similar to the sort of thing that you find uh, in the northwest of England at Carlisle Cathedral, where again, you have these uh, convex bands of foliage uh, tightly clinging to the bell of the capital going around. Um, I have to say that this uh, comparison, I think, shows the tremendous quality uh, of the work that there is uh, at Melrose. The, the work at Melrose in these first phases was very, very high quality indeed. Uh, you do not get higher quality work than this. So it does show the aspirations of this first building phase. Um, other aspects that uh, seem to be looking to particularly eastern England, but also northeastern England, are the, um, the treatment of the gables, uh, both the east gable 
and the south transept gable. I have cheated, as uh, those of you who know Melrose are probably feeling very worried at the moment because this window is filled with tracery and they're probably panicking that the architects have nicked it out, nipped it out when, when they weren't looking. But I've, I've covered it over because I don't want to mislead you with that just at the moment. I'll be showing you it later on. But I want you to have a look at uh, is this series of tabernacles stepping up and down going through the, um, going through the gable. Uh, and this sort of approach to um, gable design is something that you see, for example, in Howden Collegiate Church. I've already mentioned Howden, talking about the interior of Melrose, uh, dating from the 1320s, where again you've got these tabernacles going up and down. And Melrose, you've got um, <coughs> an OG flipped uh, hood mold. I do wish that didn't sound like one of those happy hour cocktails that you get in, in <laughs> Wotherspoons. Um, here it's an OG flip uh, hood mold. Uh, at how it's a sort of a skeletal gable that you get, uh, get going up, but the, the, the approach is really quite similar. You do get it further uh, south in eastern England as well, of course, in the uh, Lady Chapel at Ely Cathedral, which was uh, started in 1321. The work was then abandoned when the central tower fell and was eventually finished in the 1350s. But again, a similar sort of approach. So you know, all of this is supporting the idea that it's Eastern England that's being looked to, or probably more likely Northeastern England. And that comes up particularly strongly with the uh, window tracery. Um, what you have at Melrose more than you have anywhere else um, at all is lots and lots of rectilinear tracery. That's tracery that almost looks as if it was designed on grid paper with very strong verticals and horizontals. And this is the sort of uh, tracery that emerged in England, um, well, in the years, mainly in the years after 1300 and uh, uh, becoming particularly prominent some decades uh, after that. But it's a sort of tracery that you simply do not get um, outside England, uh, except in a few examples in Scotland. And this is a, a particularly extreme example of um, the sort of rectilinear tracery. Um, this, as I say, is the East Gable. Um, I mentioned that I didn't show you the East Gable when I was showing you the tabernacle work. And that's because the treatment here is slightly different because in this eastern part of Melrose, the vault rises right up into the gable in a way that it doesn't elsewhere. So the effect of the tabernacles is rather reduced. But it's the tracery that I'm really wanting to look at here. And a particular light motif of this tracery is these rather curious lozenge forms that you get in the tracery, but also these uh, triangular light heads. And that's something you don't get very often, even in English rectilinear tracery. Uh, but again, you do get them in uh, East Yorkshire or Lincolnshire. Um, here's a window of Beverly St. Mary, uh, a window dating from about uh, 1400. So I'm not suggesting there's a direct link. All I'm trying to do is to show the sort of area where you get this sort of tracery. But there again are those lozenge forms in the window there. This window is reset in a, a later uh, gable of about 1510, uh, probably. Uh, you also get it in the Guild Hall at Boston in Lincolnshire. Can you see there you've got those lozenge forms there again of about 1390. And again, you know, I'm not saying that the mason who designed Melrose uh, necessarily knew these particular examples. All I'm saying is that that's the sort of area where he would have seen that sort of detail and learned how to use it um, effectively. Um, so all of these pointing towards eastern England, particularly northeastern England, for the uh, source of the, uh, well, the place where the designer came from. It gets a bit more puzzling, though, when we get to the vault over the eastern limb. Um, this may have been completed at a later stage, but it was certainly intended to be more or less of this form right from the start. Uh, I've already mentioned that the east window goes right up into the gable because the uh, vault itself is uh, quite steeply arched. And you can also see from the wall ribs over the windows to either side that they were intended right from the start. So they do presuppose this quite steeply pointed uh, vault. And this is a, a sort of vault that's often described as a net vault uh, because it has such a complex pattern of ribs over its surface. And the really significant feature, I suppose, about this sort of vault is that it's not divided up into a series of bays that <coughs> reflect the rhythm of the arcade piers and the positions of the windows. The vault is meant to be seen as a whole, 
The ribs extend way beyond the individual bays in which they're set. You know, we do have, uh, if you look at these ribs here, you've got diagonal <coughs> ribs to each bay, and the bay is de defined by that transverse rib. But then you also have these ribs here that cross two bays, and the same would have happened in the next bay. So the whole vault is meant to be seen as a unified whole rather than as a series of uh, individual components. And the place where you see this sort of vault, uh, particularly uh, in England, uh, and you do get it especially in England, uh, in France you get variants on it in uh, areas such as Anjou, but I don't think there's any uh, reflection of that here at um, Melrose. Um, but if you look at something like Tewkesbury, I'm not suggesting a direct connection, certainly, uh, but here again you can see how this net of ribs unifies the whole of the vault at the expense of the individual bays. But I think something different is happening here at Melrose because a new idea is coming in as well that I'll be talking about in the uh, next lecture where you have pointed barrel vaults over churches uh, in which the roof over the pointed barrel vault is formed by stone flags on the upper surface, the extra loss of the vault. And you've got something rather like that uh, here. And an even more significant point, can you see that some of the ribs have actually fallen away? There must have been a rib just there. There must have been a rib just there and a rib just there. And they've left no traces whatever on the vault. Now, there may have been some reconstruction there, so we've got to be just a little bit uh, careful. But this does look as if those ribs are a purely cosmetic application of the surface of the vault. They're no longer um, forming any sort of structural element. Um, uh, they're not integral structurally uh, with the vault. Um, I tend to think of them slightly as, I don't know if any of you remember Ian Sharples on Coronation Street, but she always had a hairnet, and there's something almost like having the hairnet on the inside of the, uh, of the vault just there. And this is going to be quite significant for what happens in uh, Scottish vaulting later on. But anyway, with the possible exception of changes that we're seeing in the vault, this first phase of work at Melrose, I can't stress it enough, is really very much an English piece of work. But you, we're not going to find this Englishness reflected in many other buildings. Uh, this is a, a clear story window at Melrose, just to remind you of the sort of rectilinear tracery uh, that we can have. But Round about these years that Melrose was under construction, I know of only two other churches that have rectilinear tracery of this kind. Uh, one of them is the Forester Isle at uh, Castorfin Church, which is possibly the isle that was built by uh, for Sir Adam Forrester in about 1405. And it said it was in the churchyard, which means it really projected from the church. And the other one is uh, at Carnwath Church in Lanarkshire, uh, where um, a small college was founded in about 1424 uh, for the Somerville family. And here you have a very handsome uh, rectilinear tracery window uh, in the gable wall. And it's a very handsomely uh, contrived uh, piece of design altogether with this lovely doorway rising up into the bottom of the field of tracery. Very difficult to find parallels for that. I thought I'd found one in the uh, Divinity School at Oxford. Uh, where you have the same sort of treatment of the door going up into the window. Uh, but that was done by, uh, that, that was an adaptation by Sir, Sir Christopher Wren. So it's not really relevant for what we're looking at here at uh, Somerville. So we've got these two churches uh, that have this very, very pronouncedly English rectilinear tracery. Uh, but what about the rest of the buildings of which they form a part? Well, really, there's not very much that you would see as English um, in them, apart from the windows. This is the inside of the Forester Isle at uh, Castorpin. It's a very puzzling piece of work altogether. Uh, you can see it, uh, the roof of it, just there. It predates all this part here, which is probably of the uh, 1420s or, or later. And it, there is the suggestion that, in fact, the original parish church of uh, Castorpin uh, was on the north side of the church that's there at the moment. In fact, where a, a later aisle was added on in the 19th century. And it is possible that, in fact, this aisle that you see the, uh, the south gable of extended right up to where the um, original church was. Um, but it was covered by one of these pointed barrel vaults that um, I've mentioned uh, that we'll be looking at in the next lecture. And here again, you can see that there's been just a surface pattern of ribs. This is a little bit confusing. 
uh, you can see the, the springer, supposed springer of the rib uh, of the vault has been just here, but it's been simply cut back. Uh, and you can see where the ribs have been in the vault. Here they look to have been embedded uh, within the vault, so perhaps originally forming a structural uh, role, but they've been cut back with enormous care. And of course, they would originally have been plastered over after they'd been cut back, so we wouldn't see the ghosting of them anymore. But this is really one of the most illogical pieces of vaulting that you can find anywhere. Rather than having a, a series of bays of vaults, what you have is a series of half bays of vaults. So here, you've got a half bay of vault, and then you've got a bay of vault here, which obviously extended further northwards into this part just there. So that's something that I, th I hope you'll remember, because it will tie in with um, other buildings that we'll be looking at uh, later on. Something rather similar at the Somerville Isle at Carnwath. There's the gable wall again, uh, but this is the inside of it, and again, you can see that it's covered by a pointed barrel vault, this time with a series of parallel ribs running along the undersurface of the vault. And again, this is a type of vaulting that we're going to find um, in looking at a whole number of churches uh, later on. So it does look as if in these two churches, the rectilinear, has been, rectilinear tracery has just been taken over as a sort of design statement rather than something that's part of a, a coherent uh, approach to design. And for quite some time, you're going to be very hard pressed to find anything that you would see as being um, English. But there were later phases where just occasionally you get uh, elements of Englishness uh, coming in. And just have a quick look at some of those. One that particularly intrigues me is um, an absolutely uh, delightful little fragment at Restelrig, um, next to the restored parish church there, a small hexagonal building, um, which was uh, at one stage in its existence, um, a chapel royal. Building here was started in um, about 1477, um, and it projected from the side of the parish church. And its function really is a little bit difficult to be certain about. Um, Alistair MacDonald has suggested, I think quite convincingly, that it could actually have been um, associated with particular aspects of sacramental devotion, and that it was meant to read as a sort of pyx that you might find on an altar where the uh, consecrated host uh, was reserved. And I do find that uh, quite an attractive uh, argument. Only the lower part of it uh, survived, the lower story, and that's the plan of it just there. That's a, a rather um, a rather scratchy sketch that I attempted to give an idea of what it might just have looked like when it was uh, complete. Uh, I'm afraid it was sketched out on a, a beer mat after a long evening at the Conference of Scottish Medievalists for Alistair, so I don't make particular claims for the quality of its finish, but I think it may well have been something, uh, something like that. It was also, of course, associated with the cult of uh, St. Triduana, who is one of our most glorious uh, apocryphal saints. Uh, she's supposed to have come across with uh, St. Rule or St. Regulus uh, when he brought the relics of uh, St. Andrew. Uh, and uh, she was in the unfortunate position of being admired uh, by uh, a Pictish king. Uh, and when she sent to ask what it was that he particularly admired, he replied that it was her eyes. So she did what any well-brought-up girl would do and pulled her eyes out and sent them to the king uh, impaled on a thorn. And of course, naturally enough, she became associated with uh, diseases of the eye and the curing of them. Uh, and it is possible that there was a well house in the, uh, in the basement here, although uh, there's quite a lot of disagreement about that. But what about the, the basic design of the building? Well, this is what it looks like um, inside over there on the left. Um, and I think it would be very difficult not to see the ultimate source of this sort of centralized building with the central pier and a cone of vaulting rising from it, uh, as looking back ultimately to the sort of centralized cha uh, chapter house that you get in England, uh, possibly the first example being Worcester, where, which was a circular building. There is the difficulty that Bristol Rig is a hexagon, uh, rather than an octagon or a decagon or one of the other figures that tend to be most common for English chapter houses. Um, but there certainly was a hexagonal chapter house at the small priory of St. Margaret at King's Lynn, 
Um, and there may have been uh, other examples as well, although we can't be uh, entirely sure about those. But as I said, the basic form of the centralized building with the, uh, the central pier and the cone of vaulting rising above it is very much what you expect to find in uh, English uh, chapter houses. And just for comparison, uh, no connection, uh, particularly connection intended, but this is the chapter house at Litchfield of about 1240 to give you an idea of what um, it, that sort of building looked like. However, um, whether there was a direct English connection in this case or not, we can't quite say. Work at Restoring started in about 1477, uh, and of course in, was it 1474, there had been a marriage treaty with England at a time when the, there was rather greater rapprochement with England than there had been. So it is possible that um, Masons were looking to England at this time. But we do have to remember, of course, that there were, by this time, earlier <coughs> centralised chapter houses in Scotland. We know at least three of them. Uh, there was one out at Inchcombe, which is a very small one, which didn't have a central pier. Uh, there's one at Holyrood, which is only known from uh, excavations, which have provided very fragmentary evidence. We do still have a complete one at uh, Elgin Cathedral, uh, and this is it. Most of what you see here, though, uh, dates from reconstruction by Bishop Stuart in about 1500. But I think it is almost certain that the original form of the chapter house, which was built after the fire of 1270, uh, probably in the very last decade, last years of the 13th century. I think it probably did look like this. So it may well be that it was uh, the Masons looking to um, Scottish reflections of um, an English type rather than looking directly to uh, England itself. But I think that probably changes for a while uh, in the years around about 1500, uh, when for a very few years there really was very much more of a rapprochement with England. Uh, it was marked by the Treaty of Perpetual Peace of 1499, uh, and of course, ultimately, in the marriage of James IV and Margaret, the daughter of Henry VII of England in 1503. Uh, and of course, this is the, the wonderful, um, uh, two, two pages from the wonderful Book of Hours that was made to celebrate the marriage now in the National Library in Vienna, uh, showing James IV over there, which looks suspiciously like a portrait. You are, you are left wondering if, uh, when it was commissioned in possibly Bruges or, or Ghent, a portrait of the king was sent. Uh, the portrait of the queen is rather less uh, convincing. That looks like a, an idealized queen rather than a more personalized queen. But this symbolizes the, the sort of, uh, well, the artistic evidence of the increased rapprochement with England. Incidentally, do note the pyx that's depicted on the altar just there, which looks to be a hexagonal uh, pyx. And that could have been the sort of pyx that was being reflected in the design of Restorig. Well, how was this uh, greater rapport reflected in buildings? I'm straying outside uh, the field of churches here, but one of the most obvious uh, reflections is seen in the Great Hall at Stirling, uh, which was built in the years by uh, around about 1500, uh, probably by members of the Merlion family of uh, Master Masons. It would be lovely to know where Masons with that name uh, came from. Uh, but in the design of the hall, which of course has been uh, recently uh, restored by uh, Historic Scotland, um, what you have is a, a very large um, Great Hall, the largest that was ever built in Scotland, the day's end is flanked by uh, a pair of uh, bay windows, one on each side. The rest of the lighting of the hall is uh, clear story windows. And over it was a hammer beam roof, um, which we know the details of from a uh, survey of 1719. Uh, and we can also compare it with the um, hall roof at Edinburgh Castle. But all of those elements, I think, show um, James IV looking to one of the great halls of his father-in-law, uh, Henry VII, at um, Elton Palace, uh, in fact, built by uh, Edward IV in the 1470s. We have all of the elements um, that we see at uh, Stirling, the paired bay windows, the clear story windows, the hammer beam roof over it. So all of those elements being taken over, but it is a very Scottishized version of this. 
Uh, I think by this stage, Scottish Masons and their patrons were certainly not content just to take over ideas wholesale from elsewhere in the way that they had perhaps in the uh, 12th and 13th centuries. Uh, there really was a feeling that uh, perhaps they had to be adapted to Scottish tastes. And I think that's what we see here. Uh, and that's why I thought it was putting on despite the fact that it's not uh, ecclesiastical. Uh, you see the same thing, of course, in um, uh, a number of window types that are taken over. Uh, this is the, uh, the South Trance, the three-story trance that was um, added against the, um, the South Range of uh, Linlithgow Palace by James IV. Uh, we don't know quite when, sometime between 1488 and 1513, but probably somewhere not all that far from uh, 1500. But these windows, the rectangular windows, with uh, just a simple sequence of uh, arched headlights uh, within them. Uh, you know, that's very much the sort of thing that you're finding in England round about this time. Uh, here's Nowarth. Uh, I simply put it on because it's uh, not far over the border from Scotland, although, as you'll see from the likely date, uh, it's probably rather later than Linlithgow, uh, but I just thought it was a quite, quite a nice comparison to make. But it's not just in the secular buildings that we find ideas being taken over again. Um, we see it um, in a number of church buildings as well, uh, sometimes in isolation, uh, sometimes in groups. This is a window that uh, was put into Dunkeld uh, Cathedral, um, associated with the chapel with a rather curious dedication. Um, I'm trying to remember, I can never remember precisely what it was, but I think it was for prayers for release from the pains of hell uh, or something of the kind, very characteristic of late medieval devotion. But it has the arms of Bishop Brown uh, over the top of it. But you know, this is very much the sort of window that we've been looking at, uh, just three lights uh, rising up to a rectangular head. Here, no archers, just cusping at the head. And you get the same sort of thing in windows in the um, academic collegiate chapel at, of St. Leonard, at St Andrews, uh, which was uh, founded around about um, 1512 by Prior John Hebburn, with the uh, assistance of Archbishop Alexander Stewart. So th it's very difficult to imagine that windows of this kind would have been employed in these buildings without an awareness of uh, what was happening in England. But it really is just little motifs that are being taken over in these cases, rather than whole approaches to design lock, stock and barrel. And I think we see the same sort of thing in a number of windows um, in the great churches. This is the east apse of uh, Lilithgow, uh, Lilithgow St. Michael, um, where rebuilding uh, was eventually started um, after 1497, when agreement had been reached with St. Andrew's Cathedral Priory uh, over who was going to foot the bill for the rebuilding. But this sort of tracery that you have in the window just there, it's what's usually known simply as panel tracery, because it looks like it's just got a series of panels in the wall head. And just a comparison, I could have shown you lots of uh, buildings for comparison, but this is one that I had a photograph of. This is uh, Fotheringay Church in Northamptonshire, where if you look at the tracery within the sub-arch just there, uh, it's very like the sort of tracery that we've got there, but it's just taking over an element as a sort of uh, fashion statement. And you get the same sort of thing in the east window at uh, Stirling Holy Rood Church, not in the other windows of the apse, just in this east window, uh, where agreement was reached over the uh, rebuilding of the choir with Dunfermline, uh, Dunfermline Abbey in about 1507. So those are examples uh, of just little motifs being taken over. But now um, I'm moving on to territory, which I think is going to probably result by the end of the morning of my lifeless corpse hanging upside down from a, um, a, a, a lamppost outside the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, I want to talk about crown steeples, which are generally seen as the most archetypical uh, form of uh, tower finish in Scotland. and. Uh, Having started building crown steeples in Scotland, somehow our ancestors uh, clasped them to their bosoms with hoops of steel. Uh, they, they really did begin to be seen as almost the characteristic um, Scottish uh, termination to a tower. Only three of them are definitely known to have been built over churches in the Middle Ages. 
uh, we still have the one at King's College in Aberdeen, um, which was referred to in uh, Boyce's uh, Lives of the Bishops, um, which means it must have been in existence by 1522, and it may have been there for some years before then. Uh, but of course, it has been very extensively repaired in 1634. Uh, we have the uh, much more complex example at Edinburgh St Giles, which is assumed to date from round about 1500, although quite a lot of what you see here is uh, the result of repairs in 1648. And we also know that there was a very interesting one over the West Tower of Linlithgow St Michael, uh, which again is probably early 16th century, uh, but unfortunately it was dismantled in about 1821. And this is a great loss because this really was a very interesting one indeed. But there certainly were intentions to have them uh, elsewhere. At uh, Haddington St. Mary, uh, we have these curious uh, projections of the center of the faces of the tower, and it's very difficult to think what else they could have been other than supports for the flyers of a crown steeple. Um, and there's very strong evidence for them being planned at uh, Dundee St. Mary. Um, I was recently up in the very top part here, and you can actually see where the supports of them do start inside the tower there, but they were never built. So we've got three, we know of three definitely. There were at least two others that were um, uh, certainly intended to be built, uh, and there were probably others as well. Uh, and of course, the idea of the crown steeple was going to continue in various forms uh, over quite a long period. Um, at Linlithgow Palace, there's the fountain, which we think probably dates from 1538, because a lead pipe with that date uh, was found in the 19th century in 1894 in the course of excavations. We have the Glasgow Toll Booth, which was built by John Boyd in 1626. Uh, and we have the Linlithgow Cross Well. Uh, Linlithgow, really, you could hardly swing a cat without hitting a cross steeple in Linlithgow. Uh, this was built by John Ritchie in uh, 1628. And of course, in the 19th century, when ideas of a, a Scottish national style um, became very important to a lot of architects, we suddenly find quite a lot of crown steeples being built. Uh, the, the finest example, of course, this wonderfully sublime uh, tower with its crown steeple, the Wallace Monument at Stirling by J.T. Rockhead of 1859-69. There's the Leonard in the Fields at Perth by J.J. Stevenson, a very attractive church of 1885. Uh, there's the what's often known as the um, the Baptist uh, Cathedral at Paisley, the Coates Memorial Church by Hippolyte Blanc of 1894, again very prominently terminating the central tower there. So you know, they really were seized upon as being something very Scottish, and they do seem to have been developed much more in Scotland than elsewhere. But I find it very difficult to think that the idea originated in Scotland. In fact, the idea of trying to create these extraordinarily complex confections, you find really being developed in its earlier stages in metalwork, in microarchitecture, and in drawings. And there's no evidence that anybody in Scotland was taking part in these earlier experiments. You know, if you look at something like the, the wonderful Three Towers Reliquary in the uh, Treasury of Arkham Cathedral of about 1370, uh, you know, the way you, in these micro-architectural details, uh, you get these things that are very similar to um, uh, crown steeples rising up, up above them. In the Low Countries, uh, at Lurthen or Louvain, whichever you want, the Church of St. Peter, uh, this glorious sacrament house where the consecrated host was uh, reserved, dating from 1450. You know, it was possible, you, you almost get the feeling with the stonework here, Though the big problem with stonework is not holding it up, it's trying to hold it down to stop it flying away. They, they really are pushing what could be done with this sort of design absolutely to the uh, limits. Um, again, on a micro-architectural scale, uh, probably the finest example is the Neville Screen at Durham Cathedral, um, made in the 1370s in London, uh, poss possibly by Henry Everly, and brought up to uh, Durham. Uh, now again, the, the stone seems almost to be floating. Uh, when you go around the back of it, of course, you can see that it's in fact very well supported. It's not nearly as flimsy as it looks, but enormous effort was put into trying to make the stone look light in this way. 
And of course, you could do it in two dimensions perfectly easily. This is the brass of the priest Thomas Nelland uh, within a tabernacle. And there you almost have a design for a crown steeple. In fact, there are quite a lot of similarities with the lost crown steeple from Linlithgow in the detailing that you get there. So you know, these explorations were being carried out, in fact, from the 13th century. Um, th this is a, a medieval design for the, uh, one of the towers of Strasbourg Cathedral uh, in France. This is what's known as Design B, uh, dating from possibly around 1275, an absolutely wonderful reminder of how beautiful um, medieval architectural drawings could be. Though we do tend to forget this because, well, very few have survived in Britain, of course, but in places like Vienna and Strasbourg, we have wonderful sets of medieval drawings surviving. Uh, and this one shows just the, the quality of the workmanship that could go into these designs. And this is that design for the tower redrawn because, of course, the, the original parchment is now very faded. But this is it uh, redrawn to show just what was intended. And again, it's this feeling that you're pushing stone absolutely to the limits. It was going to be a long time before uh, work started on the towers. And in the end, um, only one of the towers was built. And this is the tower that was built in 1439. But just look how light the stone is. You know, it's, uh, it's almost like the, the, one of those puddings that you get lattices of, uh, of chocolate uh, around them. But of course, you can do it in chocolate in a rather, rather more easily than you can in stone. Uh, it is, of course, a massive maintenance uh, problem. Uh, and I don't think I've ever seen Strasbourg Cathedral without scaffolding in place trying to uh, hold it up. Um, having said that, I, I, I've stopped telling people when I'm going anywhere because as soon as the word gets out, they whip up a scaffold so that I can't uh, take a photograph of it. Uh, but this is taking this sort of, trying to lighten stone absolutely as far as it could go. And Scotland really didn't have any part in the earlier experiments. In England, there were um, experiments. At something like Coventry St. Michael, the West Tower, uh, built between 1371 and the 1430s. Here, where you have this octagon at the base of the spire, and you have the flyers going across to it, and then the spire just seeming to emerge from it. It's not as uh, ambitious, of course, as what was happening at Strasbourg, but it's in a similar spirit. And going rather further than that, there are a number of market crosses, all of which are very heavily restored. But this is the one at Chichester that dates from about 1501, where you really have got something very much closer to the idea of the crown steeple. Uh, here you have the uh, central octagon rising up, and it looks as if it's supported by these flyers at the eight corners. In fact, it isn't. Uh, there's a column of stone that goes all the way down, and you can see it just emerging uh, in the lower part of the, uh, of the market cross at the bottom there. But that's the sort of experiment that was going on in England. And eventually, the, um, the, 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 the cut was made the connection was removed from the lantern uh, and the vertical part uh, of the uh, building at Newcastle. And as far as we know, you know, there may be other cases, but as far as we know, Newcastle was probably the first place where this was done in Britain. And there, it probably dates from, well, the later years of the uh, 15th century. On the vault of the tower, there are the arms of Robert Rhodes, who died in, uh, I think it was 1474 which gives an approximate date for the tower. So that was when the, the, the final jump was made. And you, know, you get this feeling that really the lantern is a balloon that's trying to uh, head heavenwards. We know of at least one other. Uh, St. Mary Le Beau in London uh, had a crown steeple that's known from its seal uh, just here. Uh, and of course, when it was rebuilt by Sir Christopher Wren uh, between 1670 and 1680, <laughs> Uh, he did introduce a, an updated version of the crown steeple in the design just there. But I think on that basis, we have to assume that the ideas, the long chain of development that lay behind the crown steeples was something that happened in Europe and to a lesser extent in Britain. And then the step was taken at Newcastle. And it was from there that it was brought up into Scotland. And as we saw in the way that the design of the Great Hall at Stirling was adapted from the design of the Great Hall at Elton, uh, what was done was very much Scottishized to meet uh, Scottish tastes. And I think that makes it particularly interesting that that should have been done. 
I'm not absolutely convinced that the Crown Steeple was originally intended at King's College, Aberdeen. There are some very odd things happening in the lower parts of this tower. Um, the plan of the tower does actually change as it uh, goes up. And can you see how this buttress here at the, let's see, at the south end of the west face of the tower isn't at the corner? Uh, and I think that's because originally this was going to be the corner of the tower and eventually it was extended further to the south to provide a firm seating for the crown steeple. And there is a, I think, if, I think we have to be honest, there is a very slight clumsiness in the way this buttress lines up with the buttress at the corner of the crown steeple, but this one doesn't. You really feel they were having to work out their ideas. And I think there's something quite similar to this at Linlithgow as well. Because when you go up into the uh, tower at Lilithgow, there are what look like um, squinches. I do love that word. Um, the arches that bridge the corner of the tower to support a spire rather than a crown steeple. You don't need squinches, really, for a crown steeple. So I think you know, at Lilithgow, the crown steeple that was built does represent um, a change of design. So what I'm suggesting is that Although crown steeples did become a very Scottish element, uh, there is a prehistory that isn't Scottish. And at King's College Aberdeen, which is a, a very complex building by um, a patron who really had a very precise idea of exactly what it was that he was wanting. The basic design of the chapel, I think, is taken from St. Salvators in St. Andrews. There's an awful lot that's borrowed from the Netherlands in the design, in the windows, and in the ceiling. I've suggested that the Crown Steeple uh, has ultimate origins in England. And I think that's probably also the case for what was known as the Little Steeple, um, a flesh uh, that rose over the junction of the choir and the nave uh, of the uh, Collegiate Church. And this is it here. Um, unfortunately, it's been very, very much altered on a whole series of uh, occasions. It was certainly reconstructed in 1656 and probably on other occasions as well. But the rather nice thing about this flesh is that we know it was a part of a campaign of work that was being carried out by an English plumber, because there is the contract uh, of 1506 with John Burwell or Burnell, his name is spelt in different ways, for the lead work at the chapel, which I think must have included the, the little steeple. And we know that he was the sergeant plumber to Henry VII, so, uh, you know, again, we have this English connection here at, um, uh, at King's College. Um, and uh, just to uh, add absolutely nothing to what I'm saying, we do know of one other uh, flesh uh, that uh, John Burwell or Burnell uh, constructed over the Savoy Hospital in London uh, in 1519. Uh, unfortunately, of course, the Savoy Hospital itself uh, now has a very expensive hotel on its site, and uh, the expensive hotel didn't see its way to having uh, a, a replica of Burwell's flesh on top of it. And the only de depiction that we have uh, of his flesh is on this engraving by Holler, which is absolutely massively um, enlarged in this view. So it doesn't really help us very much, but I just thought I'd show you that we do know of at least one other example of the flesh that was made by uh, Burwell or Burnell. So, <clears throat> those are some of the examples of um, continuing English influence on uh, Scottish architecture. I think at the best, all that can be said is that it's a very sporadic um, influence and its impact on Scottish architecture more generally was pretty limited. But I just want to end this session by uh, really cheering us up by having a look at a number of tombs where I think the... Um, <laughs> where I think the idea of, uh, well, where I think there may have been an English origin uh, for the design. And starting off with the splendid uh, tomb of Bishop John Winchester in the uh, South Choir Chapel at Elgin Cathedral. Uh, and this is just here. It is a very nice tomb indeed. And it's very fortunate because this area of the cathedral remained covered in for a long time after the Reformation because it became the burial place of the Dukes of Gordon. And in fact, on the socket of the arch in there, we still have the underpainting of a number of angels um, who are obviously singing uh, Winchester to his rest. And a, a great reminder of just how important colour was on these tombs 
Uh, and of course, we very seldom see it uh, in place now. But um, Winchester was a rather interesting character. Um, he was a protege of Queen Margaret Beaufort, uh, and he seems to have come to Scotland in the train of James I and Queen Margaret Beaufort. And his name rather suggests that, in fact, he could also have been a protege of the Queen's uncle, Cardinal Henry Beaufort, uh, who was Bishop of Winchester, which may be where the Winchester element of his uh, name comes from. Um, but what are the main elements of the tomb? Well, there's the tomb chest with an arcaded front, pretty much as you'd expect, the effigy resting on the, um, on the tomb chest. The tomb itself is covered by this uh, OG-arched canopy, uh, with cusp cusping on the soffit and crocketing, and there would have been a finial at the apex of the um, of the arch. And on either side are buttresses with shields at midpoint, which of course would have had the shields of Winchester and his connections on them. Well, where did the idea for this tomb come from? Well, it's a type of tomb that, in fact, we do get over quite a wide area. Uh, and just as a comparison, this is the uh, tomb of Archbishop Guy d'Auvergne. Uh, at Boucher Abbey, it doesn't survive of course, but it, there's the drawing in the Garnier uh, collection, which I suppose has quite a lot of the um, elements of the design of the Winchester tomb. Uh, it has the tomb chest with the arcaded front, the cusp cusping to the arch, uh, the uh, buttresses to either side of it. It doesn't have the OG arch, but there's a lot going on there. But I don't think for anybody for a moment would think that it was likely that the idea had been taken from such a, a remote building as um, Boucher Abbey. And I think it's probably more likely that the idea was taken from a number of English uh, tombs. This is the tomb of Sir William and Lady Elizabeth Wilkett at North Lee uh, in a lovely uh, chantry chapel in Oxfordshire. We don't have the cusp cusping to the soffit of the arch, but all of the other elements are there, uh, the buttresses with the shields, in this case held by angels at mid-height, uh, and everything else is there. And I think it is very, very likely that it was from an English tomb of this kind that the idea was taken. But my reason for wanting to bring this in is that Winchester's tomb was going to have quite a, an extended progeny. Um, you'll be relieved to know that I can't show you all of them, but I think it is quite interesting to see how long an idea, once it was established, might remain current. Uh, this is another tomb at Elgin Cathedral, the tomb that's thought to be of Bishop David Stewart uh, in the uh, south transept. He died in 1476. And I think it's now got a, um, a knightly effigy in it, which doesn't belong there. Uh, but you've got the heraldry of Stewart on the, uh, on the shields, just carved rather than painted. But I think you'll see that the design of the Winchester tomb is very, very closely reflected. The arcading is perhaps just a little bit looser than it was uh, on the Winchester tomb. Um, I don't think it was the same mason who was involved, but it was somebody looking very closely at the Winchester tomb. But then you can go on from there and find a whole series of other tombs over a really quite extended period copying the same design. This is one of two tombs of members of the Ogilvy family at Fordyce Church. Uh, this is Sir James Ogilvy, who died in 1509. And again, I think you'll see that uh, very uh, similar uh, design. Um, the ferns perhaps uh, don't replicate the crockets quite as well as they might do. Uh, and we've lost the upper parts of the buttresses to either side. And again, the arcading has become rather looser. But you know, the basic design is to all, um, all intents and purposes pretty much the same. But a rather surprising um, adaptation of this design is seen very much later, almost a century after the Winchester tomb had been built at the Collegiate Church of Cullen in Banffshire, another Ogilvy tomb. It almost seems as if the Ogilvys became very attached to this sort of design. But um, if you look, you may not see it at first, but you've got all of the elements of the, uh, of the uh, Winchester tomb, the, uh, the OG arch with the cusp cusping, the buttresses to either side, the arcaded tomb chest, in this case with weepers carved in them. In the Winchester tomb they were probably painted. Uh, you also have a rather nice depiction of uh, Alexander Ogilvy's uh, soul being received by God the Father behind there, but you can't see it. But this tomb has actually been encased in a more up-to-date design, which is rather intriguing. Um, it has these great piers to either side which carry rather surprising pinnacles at the top. 
and then this miniature canopy work going along the top there. And then in the spandrels, these slightly classical roundels with depictions of uh, Alexander Ogilvy and his wife. These really, as I say, are rather, these are rather classical ideas, looking back to the idea of the Imago Clippiata that you get on, on classical tombs. But I thought I'd end with this just as an interesting demonstration of how ideas like this, once they've been established, could remain current with surprisingly long period, albeit with uh, adaptations that you see just there. So I shall stop there and uh, we'll move on in the next uh, session. Thank you.